Becoming a supporter of the Being Well Together program means access to tools and resources, allowing you to effectively develop and implement a health, safety, and well-being strategy in a joined-up, holistic way. You will see the health and well-being of your workforce improve and make the most of your investments. The Being Well Together program is available from British Safety Council or Mates in Mind, both registered charities. Hello and welcome to our webinar entitled Leadership in Health, Safety and Wellbeing. My name is Natalie Byrne Spence and I work for British Safety Council and our Being Well Together programme. And I'm delighted to be introducing this event um, this lunchtime. Research shows that integrating health, safety and wellbeing together into a strategy makes both financial and business sense. At British Safety Council, we're passionate about helping organisations just like yours to do just that. We want to help you put well-being at the heart of your organisation. So in this lunchtime webinar, you'll hear from our guest speaker, Phil Clark, Head of Health and Safety at Care UK, who will be exploring the role of leadership in improving health, safety and well-being in any organisation. The session will cover, amongst other things, how to effectively develop, assess and improve existing health, safety and well-being approaches and how to achieve results in a multi-site operation. There will also be the opportunity for questions at the end of the session with both Philip and British Safety Council's Head of Wellbeing, Marcus Herbert. Before we begin, I wanted to let you know that due to the number of attendees for our webinar today, everyone except the speakers will be on mute during this event. However, the speakers do welcome your questions, and so if you have any queries or comments as we go along, please do note them in the question box on your panel, and they will be answered throughout where we can, and any other questions um, can be answered during our question and answer session at the end of the event. If you wish to tweet or post about this event, please do use the hashtag being well together or keep thriving. If you need to leave the event at any point, please do not worry because we will be sharing a recording of the event afterwards. I would like to take this opportunity then to now introduce our speakers. Marcus Herbert is Head of Wellbeing at British Safety Council. With over 15 years of experience and two degrees in the wellbeing industry, Marcus has worked with individuals, elite athletes and executives on enhancing their own personal well-being and reducing their risk of lifestyle disease through effective behaviour change strategies. Transferring this experience into the corporate setting, Marcus has worked with organisations from micro to global on their approach to organisational well-being and how to develop an effective and meaningful well-being strategy. More recently, Marcus has developed training courses to support directors, line managers and employees on the most effective ways to embrace health and well-being at work. We are delighted to welcome Philip Clark as our guest speaker today. After a career in the British military as an intelligence analyst, Philip retrained as an environmental health practitioner in the army. He is now the head of health and safety at Care UK, one of the UK's largest care home providers, having held senior positions in a number of large multi-site organisations. Philip is passionate about helping and mentoring those new to health, safety and well-being and enjoys working with colleagues at all levels of an organisation to develop pragmatic and business focused solutions in order to demonstrate that HS is part of a wider range of issues that contribute to both mental and physical health, safety and well-being in our workplaces. So without further ado, let me pass you over to Marcus to formally introduce the event. Lovely, thanks Nat. And um, hopefully Phil, you've got your, your slides uh, all ready to go in the background and whilst, whilst you're getting that set up, I'd um, just like to say that, you know, for, for those of you that are joining us as part of our um, 2023 webinar series, welcome back. And for those of you that are joining as new attendees, good to have you here. And uh, this particular event so far has been the highest uh, registered uh, event that we've had this year. So no, no pressure, Phil, but there's a, a big audience there waiting to hear what you have to say. Um, but yeah, in terms of, you know, to make that, obviously within British Safety Council, we've been providing support and guidance to organizations in health and safety for over 60 years. Um, and in more recent years, we've now brought well-being into that offering. And uh, Phil's in a unique position where he has active experience in both health and safety and now well-being as well. And so we wanted to invite Phil to come and share some of his experience and also some of the theory behind the actions that uh, he's taken in, in previous roles and within Care UK. 
and, and Phil was happy to share his um, kind of thoughts on specific leadership within health, safety and well-being, which of course is not only by itself a factor that has an influence on well-being of an organisation, but it's also something that uh, can be the gateway to good or bad health and safety and well-being. Um, so I won't take any more of the long mic, Phil, great to have you here. I'll hand over to you and I'll come back and join you with the Q&A at the end. Okay, good uh, uh, Good afternoon everybody or good morning depending where you uh, you may be in the world. Um, I'm going to be reliant on Marcus um, who uh, will hopefully be looking at any questions or any chat that's in there. So please ask your questions as we go along. Um, and I've got to, got to make my first stand of the day as a, as a northerner. This is a dinner time session, not a uh, not a lunch time session. So uh, I thought I'd uh, get that a little bit out of the way first off. Um, Marcus, is the presentation ready to go? Can you see that? Yeah, absolutely, Phil. It's uh, crystal clear. Right, excellent. So uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, coming here today and uh, being here for my presentation. Um, I've got a few things I'd like to talk about and what I really want to do is first off use that those experiences I've had as a health and safety leader looking at how I have done things from a, an overarching health and safety perspective and then sort of use that into how I've approached well-being within my current organisation and touch on things I've done in previous organisations. Um, so I'll crack on and, and if you've got any questions, just ask as, as we're going on and say, Marcus will collate those questions, whether through the questions in the chat and uh, and then hopefully we'll have some time at the end to be able to uh, to go through some of those uh, to come some of those questions. So starting off is saying, what's leadership? And there's very many definitions about this one here is from a CIPD fact sheet that um, um, that I looked at basically there's no formal definition of leadership really is there it's very much um uh, it's a broad understanding of how people are motivated and there's lots and lots of different uh, definitions and as i was putting together this and uh, and having somebody just have a quick look they, that's when it really became focused and there's so many different definition definitions uh, and somebody came up and i don't know where this quote's from so forgive me i can't give you the reference for this one leadership is about emotional intelligence and enablement of a colleague uh, especially when we're looking at this post um, post covid world when we're looking more at hybrid working but then moving on what leadership is from a, a health and safety perspective it starts making you think is there any specific definitions for leadership in health and safety so obviously the go-to place is the health and safety executive and they talk about the principles of leadership and trying to couch them in very much health and safety terms that we should be bearing in mind when we when we become leaders and I suppose just as, a, as, a, as an aside when when I was progressing my career in, in environmental health and then moving on to focus on the health and safety side of things I never really saw myself as a leader and even when I became head of health and safety at a, a quite a large organisation here in the UK, it took me a while to, for it to click that I was a, a senior leader in an organisation and I was a, a health and safety leader. So um, at some stage in our careers in health and safety, environmental health, whatever badge you want to give it, I found I moved almost without thinking from going from advisor to manager to, to health and safety leader and um, so I didn't necessarily prepare to do that I wasn't necessarily trained but I'll talk a few things about how how I managed to do that and how I managed to use some core principles to help me what I think you know an effective what effective health and safety leadership is but the key things from the health and safety executive strong and active leadership from the top and this is talking more not necessarily as a health and safety practitioner but uh, but as, as, as a non-health and safety practitioner in, in, in a business the worker involvement because we can't do what we do without that involvement from all our stakeholders particularly the people of the operational side of our businesses and assessing and reviewing is nothing stagnant nothing stays still we need to move and what i'm going to touch on is, is some core health and safety principles and these all link into what i do and what we do as health and safety leaders or leaders in organizations so trying to find some definitions about 
health and safety leadership as well. I was fortunate enough, I uh, did uh, Darren Sutton's behavioural science for leadership course uh, last year. And Darren in this course talks about sharing a vision, getting things done through others, motivating and inspiring others, aligning the people, our people, our workforce with the and, and the activities that we do and living by the values. And we'll talk a little bit about values later on. So I highly recommend uh, you, you look at uh, the Behavioural Science for Leadership course that, uh, that Darren offers. And then more from the, maybe from the academic side, Dominic Cooper talks about effective leadership, the purpose, care and controlling. And then there's very different styles of leadership that we have. So talking about the transformational, transactional servant. And when I've been reflecting and viewing on what my sort of leadership is, is, is very much on the servant type of leadership. Just some things to bear in mind as we, uh, as we, as we move on and talk about a few things. Now, when talking about leadership in health and safety, it's tempting to try to create something brand new. But as I've been reflecting on, on how I've done things and what I've been doing, actually, it's those core basics that always keep emerging. And to me, I found, and if anybody's working in a, in a management or leadership position in health and safety, I keep coming back to the basics. HSG 65, plan, do, check, act. Um, look at uh, INDG 471, which was produced in association with the Institute of Directors. And then for my own business, what I'm in at the moment, uh, in the care home sector, HSG 220. That guidance, those basics, they can be applied and I have them in the back of my mind when I'm when I'm making decisions, when I'm getting involved in discussions, when I'm reviewing what we're doing, is really the basics, in my opinion, they work. It just just works. And so there can be a, a, a there can be a, like a um, something inside you think oh, I've got to invent something new. But actually, you know, the core things we learn as health and safety people, plan do check out from HSG 65. To me, I found it works. So it's something I. I tend to bear in mind as I'm uh, as I'm moving on, as I'm uh, progressing along and doing things within my organisation. I suppose how does that work out operationally when you're when you, you're in a health and safety leadership position? Um, again, I'm not going to say what you should be doing. I'm just going to say what works for me and what I found has worked for me in my time as a, as a health and safety leader and values that I'll continue to use as I move forward uh, in, in, my, in my roles. So the first thing I try to say is not be precious about anything. We can spend hours and hours and hours working on policies, procedures, training packages. And you think all that hard work and somebody comes back with some comments or criticisms or suggestions, you can think, oh, I've done all that work. I know what I'm talking about. I'm keeping what I've said, but no, I found that if, for me, what's been really effective is, is not being precious about anything. If I produce a piece of work and it's not working and I get feedback, I'm happy to change it. I'm happy to review. I'm happy to take into account what other people do from their experiences and their perspectives. So that's the key thing I operate under is I, I'm not precious about anything. We've already touched on worker involvement and it's, it's very easy as, as, as working in health and safety working off a particular way you're working remote hybridly or if you've got lots and lots of sites it's a sort of limit who you engage with so I mean, to me it's engaging with everybody so the way i do this is is i try to visit as many sites as possible engage with everybody i meet on the site because i can get that invaluable feedback from people and see are things working aren't things working what works I and mean, how can i motivate people how can i influence what they're doing i mentioned earlier about values every organization has value but we have our own values ourselves our own personal values and when i adopt those to uh, my approach to health and safety to health safety well-being to environmental issues sustainability my values i have for whatever i do is it's got to be simple um it's so it's simple for everybody to understand what your expectations are, how to do things. We're a business, but when I say business, I also include not-for-profits in that. Every organization, in my opinion, needs to make a profit or a surplus so it can then invest and improve. So anything that we do, we need to think, is it adding value to our organization? 
that value could be monetary value by enhancing and monetizing something you do but it could also add value in that it helps give assurance it helps give confidence uh, to the stakeholders your board your customers your residents uh, your colleagues and i so next thing is 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 making sure that things are pragmatic we can actually do these things that's linked back to engagement at all levels because if you're putting in place a solution and it's got 53 different steps and it's a relatively low risk issue are people going to be doing that does it make operational sense is it easy to achieve does it require some thought does it require a bit of training developing mentoring when you put it in place procedures but it needs to be pragmatic and think about what is your business there to do what is there to achieve but of course everything must everything needs to be safe and it doesn't mean safe full stop safe so far is this reasonably practicable so we want to make sure that people have a safe environment to work in our customers residents in my case are in a very in a, in a safe environment so they can lead fulfilling lives and also organizations are not static i've been fortunate enough to work for organizations that are um uh, that are very dynamic that are looking at changing and improving the way things looking at entering new markets doing slightly different things changing what they do so therefore one of my values when i'm developing these policies procedures interventions is try to be dynamic is try to work with the organization and respond quickly it's very easy to get bogged down and i've been there myself which try to have a bit of dynamicism and making um, making dynamic risk assessments really and and uh, uh, as you're going along not make it up as you go along use your core principles plan do check out and those core things so far is reasonably practical reasonably foreseeable risk assessments but try for a bit of dynamicism work with your organization to change things and things will change well then there's the next step is that and i found having worked for large multi-site organizations for most of my career is don't necessarily have the resources in every individual site to be able to manage the health, safety, and welfare of, uh, of our customers, our residents, our, um, our colleagues. So how do we do that? How do we influence people to do what we are hoping they do, what we want them to do, what we, what we expect of them? Well, fortunately, there are a few barriers. We don't always have the resource. I mentioned just a moment ago that not all multi-site organizations, not each individual site is large enough or has the resources to have a dedicated full-time or even part-time health, safety, well-being focus. So that's something we've got to overcome. They can be remote. How often are you going to get a visit from you or your team? I lead a team of three people. I've got three health and safety leads to cover 152 sites. So that remoteness can sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, be a barrier reputation health and safety hasn't always got the best reputation so it's how do you sometimes overcome that and how do you reach out to people i've got an office job effectively i've got a computer right in front of my screen all day every day but a lot of people a lot of people operational staff they're not in front of a computer all day day in day out so they're not going to see your missives your emails your your intranet or uh, campaigns so how do you reach out to those people how do you reach out to the people so that who the other side of that digital divide that does exist so these are sort of things that i've put in place these are sort of things i've thought about when trying to uh, try to manage a multi-site organization from a health and safety and well-being perspective so not in any particular order um but one of the key things I look at is how do I communicate and engage with people? So um, one thing the pandemic taught us is that we can work remotely, we can work hybrid in a hybrid fashion. Um, so it's, it's using the tools you've got to communicate and engage with people. So it's yes, it's doing things like this, webinars internally as well as externally. It's putting posters in staff rooms, some of the basic simple things that we, that we learn when we're doing our NEVOSH certificate. These sorts of things work and do help engage people. I talked about one of the barriers of resources. So we don't have limitless resources. So we need to think about how can we uh, how can we maximize that resource? 
So we prioritize things. So we risk profile our sites, risk profile the activities that are happening on our sites. So to focus on those and um, the higher risk or the higher hazard areas. So again, back to the back to that core um, the core things we do in health and safety, the risk assessment. And so you need to do that yourself as assessing which risks need to be assessed first. Talked about it already, pragmatic operational focus. Because they're remote sites without necessarily supervision from myself, my health and safety leads or other people in, uh, in, in, in support functions, how do you You've got to make sure that what you're expecting them to do is it works locally, it works operationally. Um, so you're not there to supervise and monitor all the time. I always alluded to it, assess, develop and improve. Nothing static, be dynamic. Keep assessing what you're doing. Can you develop it? Can you improve it? Of course, you then need to qualify. You don't want continuous change because that can have negative effects as well. So you have to be very careful and build that into your management system. Because again, going back to those fundamentals we learn in health and safety when we're initially developing, management systems do work. If you have an effective management system, that can underpin everything that we do. And in particular, if the management system acknowledges people working in multi-sites, different sites without that supervision, et cetera, then that to me is good. And I think really the way I try to do things is empower people locally to make decisions. I don't want people to having to call my health and safety leads or myself every time they want to make a decision yes we're here to support them but if we can empower people we can train people we can give people the confidence to make decisions locally in my experience that can be very ineffective way that can be a very effective way of managing health and safety in a multi-site environment so it's been very much a whistle stop about leadership and managing the multi-site environment so now i'm thinking how can we apply this to an issue? So how can this apply to well-being? How can it apply to what I've been doing here in uh, in Care UK and, and previous organisations? So hopefully we've got a poll that's set up. So hopefully Marcus will uh, be able to set that up now. Is well-being a health and safety issue? Simple yes or no? Yeah, thanks, Phil. We'll get just uh, <clears throat> ask the events team to bring up the poll question, um, and then what will happen is people will be able to see that poll question and submit their answer, and then we'll be able to see the results shortly after that. We're, we're only going to give around about 30 seconds to complete this, so don't think about it too much. Just give us your initial thought process, select the answer, and then in a moment, we'll see the results. Few more seconds. And then if we've got some submissions, if we could now have a look at the results, please. There you go, Phil. I uh, oh. 96, well, it was a bit of a loady question really, wasn't it? <laughs> so uh, I'm glad that, uh, I'm glad that it, it is the majority saying yes, which means I can, uh, I can now continue, um, continue with the, with the talk. And I realise that my screen has gone a little bit funny. So um, can you see the presentation? Actually, yep. no, not not at the moment for me and um, it just might take a moment to load up yeah okay that looks like it's come through now phil yeah well i anticipated the answer the majority would say yes so thank you very much everybody for for voting in that so yes it is a health and safety issue why um because we ultimately we're looking at what hazards are people facing in the workplace and what we're doing so far is as reasonably practicable to uh, to help them with the potential hazards those reasonably foreseeable hazards again going back to some of the basic things so it is another hazard in the workplace it's something we should have involvement with and what i'm going to just briefly talk about is 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 the approach we've taken in uh, in care uk and how some of those principles of health and safety leadership have used some of those so start off with the issue we've got over 150 operational sites 13,000 employees the central team for health and safety is myself and three health and safety leads 
And when I joined and when we're relaunching the wellbeing strategy here in Care UK, uh, very much in the care home sector, it's pandemic recovery. It's um, uh, had a devastating impact on us and we're, we're still recovering. But actually part of that recovery is looking at our employees and our residents' wellbeing. So the question is, is there a, an appetite for a wellbeing strategy? Unfortunate, yes, there is a quick uh, engagement with, the, with, with our executive team. And um, so, yes, from, from our perspective, there is, and that's, very, that's, that's really good news from my perspective. Other organisations, doing some reading earlier on today, a bit of for background, some organisations, there's not really that appetite at the moment. So uh, that's something that we need to bear in mind and something you need to bear in mind when I'm showing what we did and how we did it. I'm saying we because it wasn't just me. It wasn't just a health and safety team doing this thing in isolation. It was a lots of stakeholders involved lots of people involved in the discussions and in the decisions so although i'd like to take credit really in reality it's very much a, a team effort to uh, to bring things together yeah um so is this an issue united kingdom we're only 19th in the world happiness index of course some of you may be from uh, from outside the uk and you may be from countries that are higher on there um are we unhappy as a people do we need well-being support? Well, I think yes, we do. So what's my involvement? What's health and safety involvement? Well, it's, it's using those principles I've been talking about, those health and safety leadership principles. It's using the basic health and safety principles of risk assessment, of plan, do, check, act. Thinking about those things as, a, as a discussing um, and decision making when we first are developing that well-being strategy and then thinking of interventions and what we can do. Um, health and safety is one of those um, areas that gets across all aspects of the business and that I found was very very useful in bringing people together finding out what's going on engaging with people because we work at all different levels of the of the business and I probably keep banging on about it but uh, is that um, is that one of those core tenants of health and safety it's being reasonably practicable we can't do everything at once Therefore, we need to be practical about this. We need to look at what resources we have, what interventions we can make, what short, medium and long term interventions we can make. So it's risk profile and it's assessing what we have and what we can do in that term, in, in that short, medium, long term. There are difficult conversations to be had. Um, we need resource. We need money. We need and it's time as well, because. It's not just a case of throwing money at an issue, it's how does the project fit in with other business activities? So that's why we need to be pragmatic. And I said earlier, understand and what the operational focus is. How can we link these things into business priorities? Because to make it BAU as BAU as possible, I find it's easier to implement and fit in with the normal operational tempo you have in an organization. We also need to know, are we doing it right? So we need to develop KPIs. Yes, we're going to develop KPIs of how many people have been trained, but also feedback and looking at sickness absent rates. And I might have time to talk a few, about a few more of those, those issues. Of course, go back to the Health and Safety Executive and their website and look at the resources that are available. Um, yes, the HSC has got, got an approach to wellbeing, focuses more on the work related stress issue so the management standards but well, these are things we need to bear in mind because they do fit in very much into the well-being strategy looking at what your stress management protocols are how do you manage stress at work um probably like most businesses we uh, look at the core of it the, uh, the six management standards that the health and safety executive have and so they underpin a lot of what we do why do we do it it's, it's the right thing to do, you know. Why am I involved in health and safety? Because it's the right thing to do. People shouldn't get injured, become ill because of the work they're doing. But to me, you do a, a good day's work. You should, you might be a little bit tired, but you should go home feeling invigorated, a sense of satisfaction, you've done a good job. So it's the right thing to do. However, I talked about 
difficult conversations you something you may need to have with with your uh, exec with your leaders in your organizations and it's linked to kpi so it's post as well as pre putting in the well-being strategy but there are suggestions there is research to suggest having a good well-being strategy will reduce staff turnover reduce st staff absent rates also thinking about it the term presenteeism reduce presenteeism as well can it encourage people to join our organization i work in an industry where we do have issues with recruiting carers so if we can become a they look after your well-being organization perhaps that can help and encourage people to join us and that's linked in very much with reputation if you're looking after your staff you're looking after your customers or in our case we're looking after our residents not just from a physical health and safety from mental health and well-being perspective it can add to your reputation as a business as an organization Again, there is research to suggest that um, empirical evidence supports that you've got increased productivity and a, and, a, and a lower accident rate as well. So there's those sorts of things that we do need to bear in mind when we are trying to promote uh, and get approvals for, for, for our, our well-being strategies that we, that we may want to put into place. So follow a number of steps. I'll put them in there. They're not any particular order some things happen at the same time so i joined care uk at a time when we we're starting to develop that so we identified who are the key people in the organization i'll come on to some of those key people in a, in a moment every organization has a values and vision so it's part one of the first thing you need to do is define what is your vision and strategy and then one of the key things i think you'd be surprised how much are you doing already how much are you doing already so you don't need to do anything extra you perhaps just need to bring together things and you can actually see you've actually got a well-being strategy in place without even thinking about it <clears throat> this day and age we need to look at our budgets how much money we've we got to spend are there any partners we can work with training partners to provide some training that we may need or developmental support i talked about kpis we've done surveys and obviously we need to launch the uh, the well-being strategy and you know just to uh, take a step back what is well-being well if you if you understand what well-being is you can find who you need to be working with for your strategy you can find actually you're doing a lot of things already so from my perspective split into five areas financial well-being especially with the cost of living crisis we're having at the moment social workplace which is from a health pure health and safety perspective hazard at work therefore we need to do something about it your emotional well-being your physical well-being and your mental well-being so it's lots of different aspects make up well-being it's not just one thing so if you think of a wider perspective you can look at different interventions different strategies for different aspects of well-being that we can be looking at touched on it earlier are we already looking at well-being well employee benefits that's part of that well-being and going back to um what mentioned just a moment ago different aspects of well-being employee benefits up there for the financial or you've got the employer assistance program that can help with our um, emotional and mental health and well-being employee benefits may have gyms on your sites you may have cheap gym memberships that can go for helping towards the, the physical aspects of well-being but underpinning everything as well so you don't necessarily need to write lots and lots of policies most organizations especially the medium and larger organizations will already have resources and policies and procedures to look at equality diversity risk assessment dignity at work stress at work employee relations so we, you're probably doing more than you actually think you're doing so part of leading the well-being strategy is being able to identify what you're already doing and bringing it together don't horrible cliche to use don't reinvent the wheel there's no need to do that and then there's, by bringing lots of different people together and there's a core i think of about five of us who were um who were involved in in developing and defining this actually you can find different ways of doing things and i said earlier about don't be precious about anything in my mind we we're going to have a well-being hub and everything will direct to the well-being hub but as part of those discussions and bring together a team actually we found that our perks at work 
our employee benefits hub is the is a great way to to put all these touch points to get to the well-being uh, resources that managers and colleagues and residents may need so rather than developing a, a bespoke well-being hub we've got a, a perks at work hub that works really really effectively so we blister onto that and um, we took some surveys so we, um, we, we we took some feedback from initial strategy uh, and we found that one thing we could quickly put into place and add on, yes, is directing people to sign up for Perks at Works, where you can get percentages off your IKEA bill and your Tesco bill and things uh, and those sorts of issues. Um, so we put in some cost of living support, some newsletters and posters and emails and things like that, just to just to remind people that there are ways to save a little bit of money. Also, if people are doing things locally, to embrace that. To support them doing things locally if they come up with a great local campaign yeah say so we're not precious about what we do is we can be inspired by it or we can copy it and just roll it out to other places and then one thing we thought something's tangible um it's something public and people can see perhaps an investment some some direct resources is uh, is mental health first aid so we found that we have a, a number of people who are already qualified as mental health first aiders from their previous roles um but we thought we'd put in place a um, a program to uh, ensure that at least one person in all of our homes was a qualified mental health first aider so how do we do that well things happen at the same time but just to split it down to, to show the processes and what we what things we looked at is identified a training partner not just somebody who will offer the courses but somebody who will be able to give back metrics and data and people have passed what their pass rate is people have attended successfully completed but they also provide support it's not just support as in resources to help people in their role as mental health first aider but the training partner we found they and are working with they provide emotional support because being a mental health first aider is not it requires support for them because you can mental health first aid can be dealing with some some very um very very issues that can be very emotional not just to the person who's bringing it up but for the mental health first data so um it's important we have support mechanisms in place for the mental health first data and at first we thought do we just open it to anyone volunteers but we thought no we need to have a a selection criteria and our selection criteria is because we're investing a lot of money to people is people who've been with the business um i think for two years and people who'd shown um good or better for the values in the in, in, in appraisals that was the sort of basic but it wasn't set in stone it wasn't a case you've not done two years you can't do it if people volunteer or we find people who we think would make great mental health first aiders there was flexibility and we could adapt and be dynamic with uh, with who who we're putting forward to the training we define the role as well um and so emphasizing that um it's they're not being a trained therapist or psychiatrist is very much local and the way i look at it we have our traditional physical first aid at work the emergency first aid at work the, the one could day course or the first aid at work the three to four day course where we look at our, our physical uh, first aid requirements to me i'd like mental health first aid to become just routine in many respects like your first aid at work or traditional physical first aid at work and as just mentioned earlier we've, we've got a support network for it but the emphasis really is they are not trained to be therapists they are not trained to be psychiatrists they're there to offer guidance through and listening and being non-judgmental and then knowing where to signpost people to for um for professional support if, if they need it but does mental health first aid work um looked in some of the literature and there's quite a uh, an interesting document rr 1135 that the health and safety executive did and in summary the research is limited evidence um but generally if it's adapted to workplaces it does improve the ability to help colleagues within a workplace 
there is consistent evidence in the research that uh, increases people's awareness of the issues, the signs and symptoms for uh, for mental health issues, well-being issues. However, ultimately, it's a relatively new thing that's in place. So there's a limitation of the studies. To, so we can't simply say, does mental health first aid work, yes or no? We can't say for certain yes or no. Anecdotally, it's, it, it is working and as more studies have been doing, I think the effectiveness of having mental health first aid is as part of an overall well-being strategy. It's not the, oh, we'll put in place mental health first aid as that's all we need to do. It needs to be part of a wider well-being strategy. So where are we on the journey? Initial surveys encouraging. Um, we think we've got a, a culture where colleagues and residents, because we're rolling it out not just for our colleagues, the well-being, but for our residents as well, who we who we look after, who we provide a home for. Um, and just increase that confidence if people do have mental health related issues or well-being related issues. Um, and we're rolling out the mental health first aid courses, the first cohort started in February. And we have trained to date 30 people and we've got another 120 people we're, um, uh, who've been nominated to attend mental health first aid courses uh, by the end of the year. Um, and it's not just people in the homes, which that's the most, that's, that's very important, but we also identified people in head office in Colchester, but also people who go to multiple homes. Uh, so um, my team are trainers, mental health first aiders, and and I'm on I'm on the mental health first aiding course in uh, in June this year. And the courses are a mixture of face to face and remote. And the feedback is the remote ones, people are a bit skeptical about attending a two day mental health first aid course remotely. But the feedback I've had is is very very positive, um, and uh, it, it, and it works. So uh, face to face or uh, or or, or um, remote it seems to be effective for both so the next steps is to do more surveys to see how effective it's going start gathering and reporting on the kpis and keep talking keep discussing thinking about the way i look at things assess develop and improve which is basically plan do check out so we've got that cycle of continuous improvement going back to those basics as a health and safety profession we learned when we do our NEVO certificates or other courses so yeah, I'm very positive. I'm, I'm um, from a personal perspective, I think it, it underpins why we do this job. It's the right thing to do. You can help our residents, we can help our, our colleagues. And to me, it's just the right thing to do. It's why we're in this role. It's, it's why we want to, to help people um, uh, fulfill their lives, whether it be uh, from their private life, their personal life, and also their, their, their working lives. So just a couple of takeaways before I conclude my part and hopefully got a little bit of time left for anybody questions is that just a few takeaways from this. Don't be precious about anything. Um, think freely, engage and discuss with your with your colleagues, with, with, with all people in your business and your customers, depending on what sort of business you're in. Although wellbeing is a health and safety issue, it's not a health and safety issue in isolation covers numerous areas and if you take a step back and look you're probably doing an awful lot already in your organizations to look at your uh, colleagues uh, uh, physical and mental health and well-being and assess develop and improve don't stand still think about that cycle of continuous improvement assessing what you're doing can you develop and can you improve what you're doing so thank you very much for your time everybody if you want to get in touch with me, reach out to me. There's some of the contact details I have. And back over to Marcus. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Phil. I've got a, a couple of questions myself um, before we pick up some of the Q&A that have come through, uh, actually, from, from the audience. Um, but before I do that, just to kind of click through the formalities, uh, just to let everybody know that by attending the... Oh, Phil, did you want to bring your, your slide back up? I was just going to let people know they just got the QR code on the screen. Um, so, yeah, for, as, as a result of attending the session today as, as part of our webinar series, uh, when, the, when the slide comes back up, there's a QR code on the screen. 
And if you've got your phone um, and you're able to open up the scanner, you can actually just scan the screen. And what that will do is open up a form and you're able to complete your details. And you can get access to a 30 minute complimentary call with one of our wellbeing experts um, as a result of attending the webinar today. Um, and if you don't have that kind of scan functionality on your phone, not a problem. And there's also a, an email address and also a telephone number on the screen. Um, you can take, uh, you can jot those down. We'll just keep it up in, in the background for the moment. Um, and you can reach out to us. And of course, we've got our social media channels in, in addition to Phil's. And um, so please do feel free to um, follow and use the necessary hashtags. Um, so Phil, if we leave that up on the screen just for the moment, so people have got time to scan and also, um, you know, write down those those contact bits of information. Thanks very much for, you know, sharing your insight. Um, you know, obviously, what we're trying to do with these webinars is provide access to information where people have found success, and where people have found challenges within their roles in health and your well-being. So really interesting to hear, you know, the journey that you've had, um, and in, you've kind of picked out a couple of things that I wanted to just ask a, a few questions about. That's okay. Um, yeah. One of them, I think, is probably a bit of a tricky question, um, but I, knowing you, Phil, I'm, I'm sure you'll you'll have a good answer for it. Uh, you mentioned it early on in the in the presentation that you didn't realise to start off with that you ultimately were a leader in health, safety, and, and more recently well-being. So, what was it that ultimately led you to realise that that was the case? Um, I suppose it, it, if I, uh, I take a step back, in that um, I was a, um, a health and safety manager, and then there's a reorganisation and a post of head of health and safety was 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 uh, created and I was asked to be the interim one and I thought very much that oh, I'm just doing interim and we'll find somebody decent to take over the role and went through a recruitment process against other people as well and I was appointed the head of health and safety and it took maybe about 18 months for it to settle in and it, it's not something you realize at the moment yeah you get a bit of a pay rise going from manager to a head of health and safety that's <laughs> That's not that bad, um, but it's just suddenly starting being invited and being told, you remember the senior leadership team, mm. you've got easier and more direct access to board members and directors. And so it's a gradual sort of thing. And, and I was lucky as well that um, the, the person who appointed me head of health and safety, they probably realized at the time that I had potential, but I wasn't quite ready. So they spent the first few months mentoring me as well. And it's going through that mentoring period, going through being mentored by by my boss ultimately. It that slowly drew it out of me to think, yeah, oh, actually, I'm a, I'm a health and safety leader. Um, mm. And I suppose the other touch point was I, I moved industry, so I didn't go. I went into a new industry from health healthcare, um, and I thought, well, I'm not going to suddenly be the head of health and safety, be a construction company. I'll be the associate director, associate head of health and safety. And when I was no longer the boss and I saw a job advert for head of health and safety, I was thinking, I miss being head of health and safety. I miss being a, the leader of health and safety in a large organisation. So you're right, I can waffle on for ages. I'll shut up now. But it was a gradual process. There was no sudden light bulb moment for, yeah. for me uh, at becoming a health and safety leader. Well, you know, in, it's interesting that leading into the kind of preparation for pulling this event together when we were, we've had a few calls um, to discuss the content. And I was, you know, quite, you know, surprised and pleased at how much you were talking about wellbeing specifically, considering you are head of health and safety. And so I asked you the question at the time, are you solely responsible for the wellbeing within your organization? And I think you gave me quite a, a good answer at the time. So I'll ask that same question again, you know, who's responsible for wellbeing in your organization? Everybody. Um, it's, I suppose it goes back to the core health and safety, well, you know, the health and safety work, etc. Everybody has a certain amount of responsibilities. Um, from, a, from a pragmatic perspective, there's a core of, I think, five of us. I think one of them's on the core. Um, so that's why I've got to say it was five of us doing it, not just me and one person. Uh, but no, no, as, as I said, it, it, you can be given that job, but when you start looking at it, you find that fellow heads of or managers, they're doing things that are part of that, that strategy. So why take it off them if they're doing a really good job and they really like doing that job? Why change anything they're doing? So it's a, it's a group effort. Uh, there's no one as in, we will do this, we will not do that. It's a consensus-based 
strategy because I think from a well-being, because it covers a lot in drawing from lots of different areas, you need to have that consensus. So if it goes right, it's of course I've got to be flippant and say if it goes right and it's wonderful, it's all my responsibility. So <laughs> of course, I wouldn't doubt it. So I'll, I'll leave my other questions for another time, and we'll get some questions now from the audience. I think that we've had. Uh, some questions coming through, Natalie. If you'd uh... yeah, we've had we've had quite a few come through actually. Um, so the first is from Deborah, and she says I've delivered um, health and safety compliance audits, but well-being does not make an appearance within the question set. I feel that health and safety is seen more as the physical aspects, i.e., slips, trips, and falls, working at height, etc. There is a need to highlight well-being as part of the health aspect of this work area. So, do you have any tips on how to do that? I think Deborah, thank you very much for the question. I think actually you, you are right because very much for um, health and safety, we focus on the safety side of things. When we look at the annual stats, we look at 150 tragedies where people died, and that's the headline. Um, that's the headline figure. Whereas actually the health side, and depending on which surveys you look at and how the estimates are done, it's 20, 30, 40, 50,000 people die each year from work. So that headline safety bit Deborah as you say it, that's quite misleading really isn't it so it's very easy to look on fixtures and fittings when you're doing an audit it's very easy to look at paperwork have you done this that or the other and that's one of the things I'm looking at is how can we how can we audit from a, from a well-being perspective so there are the usual sort of things so we're not doing it at the moment because we're waiting and giving time for everybody to have an opportunity to get mental health first aiders but we ask the questions do we have suitable emergency first aiders in our, or, or basic life support that we offer in your home yes or no well we'll be adding that do you have suitable vision for mental health first aiders that's one thing we're going to be asking but then it's also looking at um, when we're doing the war crowns when we do the, the hazard spotting it's to look at are they displaying the posters have they got the EAP leaflets um, are they uh, got the leaflets and have the given information to the staff that perks at work and all the other aspects of well-being so it's, it's auditing from that perspective and it's also engaging with staff as well talking with them and it's key there language talking with people not to people not at people talking with people so you can gain the culture and that's it's difficult to write down yes or no when you're doing a filling a spreadsheet or or whatever so it's it's very much comes under the banner anything else question and if you think about it in terms of ISO standards it's thinking is a major non-conformity minor non-conformity and write it up from that perspective and then gather all that data and then see is it just something to one site or is it multiple sites or is it one particular um, role within the site that, that have been impacted on it? so it is very difficult it's something we're still developing so perhaps this time next year I can tell you how we've how we've worked out and what works from an auditing perspective well there's um, yeah. just to add to that as well Joe. Um, so um obviously because of the the experience within health and safety and, and auditing within british safety council and um, we've actually developed a health safety and well-being audit and also a second well-being audit as well um, and and rather than being a traditional audit which just assesses what's in place and what isn't in place it also comes with guidance um, as to what the best practice looks like um, and so what we're finding is that, you know, we're, we're very familiar working with the health and safety sector. And so the language of the wellbeing audit is very familiar to health and safety organisations as well. Um, and from the audits we've done so far, it really has helped to shine the light on what areas need improvement. Well, just, just a point on that. I think um, one of the things I, I, I talk about is that as a health and safety professional, the core skills you learn, um, they can be applied to very, very many different different areas and different issues. So. I think that a health and safety profession is, is, is perfectly placed. One, they go around a lot of the organisation. Two, they'll go to most of the operational sites. And three, we know how to ward it. We know how to assess. So we're, we're a really good resource for organisations to um, to monitor, to review, to assess and to ward it, not just physical safety, but uh, I think really important, Deborah, and we, we need to perhaps be, we need to talk more about it the, the, the mental and well-being aspects of, of safety as well. Thank you for your question. Okay, we shall we shall move on to the next. There are quite a few. So um, actually, the the next one I think we may have answered in part because um, Ray asked, in your view and experience, the well-being part of health and safety is it better sitting in 
human resources teams or health and safety teams? And I think, I mean, we have touched on that a little bit because I, mean, I can see, you know, it's a company-wide um, view that you have when it comes to, to the well-being part of health and safety. And I think we probably would agree it's, it's everyone's responsibility. Um, if you want to make a quick comment on that, and then we could, we could whiz on to the next perhaps. Uh, to lead on health and safety, it could be the head of health and sorry. To lead on well-being, it could be the head of health and safety. Quite equally, it could be the head of well-being. It's, it's what interests people have got, uh, what resources they've got within their teams as well, and uh, what experiences they've got. So it, it don't be precious about um, health and safety. They've got to lead well-being. If somebody else is in a better place within your organisation, the unique aspects of your organisation, then then let them lead and, and help them to best your ability. I suppose that's what we have to remember is that every organisation is different um, and so you know it, it could be different for you know in, in, in different cases and different sites even. Um, the next question we have is from Neil and he says what is the difference between the emotional and mental pillars that you had shown there? Uh, uh, yeah this is a very difficult question <laughs> and there is there is a, a, a difference is that I suppose mental health it's more linked to mental health conditions that people may have and emotional is people do get emotional and upset about things that are that can be very much temporary sorts of things it's um and it, it, something can impact you emotionally without affecting your mental health but that's something you need to consider people need a moment of peace and quiet because they've, they've had some bad news uh, it's not necessarily going to affect them from a mental health perspective but you may just need to give them time and I suppose in many organisations that's where we have compassionate leave comes into, into place it's, a, it's an emotional it's compassionate rather than a, a mental health condition where you need to be you know formally see a ther therapist a psychiatrist or whatever intervention that, that's required for that person so it's a subtle difference um, but it's, it, it's just something to bear in mind that well-being covers a wide area and I split it maybe artificially into five aspects but uh, within your own organisation, your own way you think and feel, you can narrow it down into fewer or you can you can widen into more. That's great, thank you. And I think just looking at the time, this might have to be our last question. Um, it's from Jemima. She says, it's great that you had wellbeing buy-in from your senior leaders. Our senior leaders aren't, haven't yet bought into the concept and they don't understand that it will help with the bottom line. Um, so how would you suggest we get buy-in from them? So I, I don't know, I don't know if Phil, you want to answer this and Marcus, you might want to chime in. I can quick, quickly do the first bit is actually look at what you're doing already. So as I said earlier on, you're probably doing a lot of things already that are linked to well-being. Some of those policies and procedure, equality, dignity at work, stress management, uh, your employer assistance program, if you have one, perks at work, employee benefits if you start bringing those together you can show your leaders actually we are doing things we just need to uh, perhaps formalize a bit and put a few kpis so we can assess where we are and then that may persuade them to release additional fund and resources time off for people to do mental health first aid courses for example or uh, time within calendars and diaries to have um, uh, tea and jaffa cakes at one of our homes uh, uh, one day a week where people can have drop-in sessions so look at what you're doing already you may find like i found we're doing a lot we just need to bring it together so just, you don't need necessarily do more additional resources focus on what are the good things you're doing already to show the value and I'll, I'll just kind of add to that to say that it depends on what the drivers of the organization are that determine how you present the case to them for the reasons to invest in well-being and so and actually as part of the uh, annual well-being conference that we're hosting on the 18th of april i'll actually be delivering a session that is uh, you know, on how to present the business case for well-being. So it might be worth having a look at that. That's a very good suggestion. Um, well, um, unfortunately, um, we, we have run out of time. Um, so I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap up. Um, so it's just down to me to say a very big thank you to both of our speakers this morning. Um, Marcus, you spoke a little less than Phil, um, but it was it was brilliant to hear from both of you. And, and Philip particularly, um, 
wonderful to hear about your initiatives at Care UK. Um, and I think your point about keeping the lines of communication open is a really important one. So, you know, I'll definitely take that away today. Um, I'd also like to um, thank our attendees for joining us this lunchtime and for participating in the webinar. We hope you found the session useful and informative. Um, and just a little reminder that as our webinar closes now, there will be a short survey at the end, and we would really appreciate your feedback. It should take less than a minute. Um, if you'd like to hear more about the Being Well Together programme or our upcoming webinar, also the Wellbeing Conference, do take a look at the Being Well Together website, which is beingwelltogether.org. Um, so a big thank you once more, and um, I wish everyone a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you.